Can you imagine being a Russian and essentially looking Vladimir Putin in the eye and saying no to him? Well, our next guest did that and has lived to tell about it. Former member of Russia's state Duma, Ilya Ponomarev, was the only Russian politician to buck Putin and vote no to Russia going into Crimea in 2014 and annex it. For his vote against Putin, he was forced into exile. He knows Putin. I spoke to him about Putin and much more. It's nice to see you, sir. Thanks for having me. Okay, so you voted against Crimea ex annexation. I voted for Crimea, but against the annexation okay, of okay. Crimea. Okay, against, against <laughs> annexation. Okay, good. All right, um, tell me, um, how did you get forced out? Actually, I was uh, on a business trip a uh, couple of months uh, since that vote. I was in a pretty much of an isolation inside the country, but uh, I was prompted several times. It was Putin relaying a message to me that if you go, you know, we will not prosecute you, so just get lost, please. But I was refusing. And when I was on a business trip uh, uh, in summer 2014, they just uh, closed the border for me so that I will not be able to come back. Did you try to get back in? Yeah, I tried. They uh, arrested uh, all my uh, uh, accounts. Uh, they uh, stop my phones from working. And I was lucky to actually stuck being in the U.S. at that time because it, I was on a long trip and I could have stuck in a way worse place somewhere in southeastern Asia. Uh, so that was a little bit of luck on my side. You know, here, here we often hear stories about people who disagree with Putin. They suddenly fall out windows. Um, yes. They suddenly get poisoned. Um, are, obviously, Putin probably is not a big fan of yours. Fair enough, right? He doesn't like yeah, you. Yeah. Um, do you worry about your safety? No, I naturally do. I'm a mortal person. Uh, and uh, in Ukraine, where I live, I have a lot of security uh, uh, around these days. I uh, experienced two uh, assassination attempts on me uh, already, but they were discovered by uh, Ukrainian security forces, so here I'm talking to you. Uh, uh, just, do you have a number of how many assassination attempts, how many plots? No, so there were there were two. There, there was one in uh, 2017 uh, by uh, some Chechen guys working for uh, Kadyrov, and there was another one recently after the uh, invasion has started. Um, obviously, you know Putin. Yeah, I do. When did you first meet him? Oh, first time I don't even uh, remember. I think that first time I saw him when he was still vice mayor of St. Petersburg in the 90s. But uh, when he was present, we were meeting several times uh, during, uh, during events. Uh, but uh, I had just one tete-a-tete -tete meeting with him, which was in 2013, I believe. So what's he like? He is very likable. He is likable. He is very likable. He is a I mean, a guy who's trying to assassinate you doesn't seem particularly likable to no, me. It's, uh, you should just know it, because that's his uh, professional training as a KGB officer. So when he's talking to you, you feel like for the first time in your life, you uh, go to a person who really understands you. That's, that's the, the feeling that uh, you are getting. And it's so easy to be fooled. And we saw examples in the past. Uh, remember, uh, President uh, George W. Bush said that I looked in his eyes and saw his soul. That's uh, the kind of impression that he is uh, getting on people. So what drives him now? I mean, he's under indictment in The Hague for war crimes, including doing what you know, seems unthinkable, taking Ukrainian children and kidnapping them to Russia. So what is driving him? No, right now I think that the main uh, drive is just uh, simple survival, because he went so far, so he cannot stop. But so why did he do it in the first place, though? I mean, I, I, I get—I mean, there's the whole conflict of Crimea, which obviously you agree, you disagreed to the annexation, um, and ended up being blocked from going back to Russia. But I mean, what's what's his thing about Ukraine? Uh, look, uh, he, uh, by his nature, he's a mediocrity. And he was studied at school, at university, he was getting, like, C grades. Uh, Nothing local. wrong with the C, had a few of myself. <laughs> <laughs> had a few of myself. Oh, um, and he uh, tried to uh, be respectable in the West. He was uh, getting to the position of the president by accident. He was appointed. He was not elected. It was uh, Boris Yeltsin who decided that this guy would be a, a safe gatekeeper for his uh, family. And that's, uh, let's take him to the first position. He is the safest. Uh, but it appeared, it appeared differently. And Putin always was fighting for this uh, respect in the West. And he was 
always as a gam as a gambler. He was raising stakes uh, uh, for others to like him, to respect him, to say that he is the greatest. And he always tried to play this card that uh, you know the Western leaders they are coming and going, but he is there to stay. Uh, is he responsible for those assassinations that we read about, you know, people falling out of windows and everything? Are these direct orders from him? No, definitely. I, I don't think that, obviously, all of them, uh, because he, he, he likes to delegate in this, uh, in, in this regards. And uh, there are a lot of people around him who are just guessing what the boss wants to do, and they're executing even ungiven orders. But uh, Putin is working as a person who covers the, uh, the results at the end of the day. So he stops investigations, uh, he protects people, he gives them uh, nice positions, uh, like uh, one of the first high-profile assassinations that the world learned about was uh, against my uh, good friend uh, Sasha Litvinenko in London, who was working with uh, Boris Berezovsky and also was a former KGB officer. Uh, and uh, uh, he was poisoned with polonium in, in London, and it was uh, identified that it was uh, done by uh, someone uh, called uh, Mr. Lugavoy. And after it was discovered, Lugavoy was immediately got elected to the State Duma under Putin's orders to give him immunity from the prosecution. Well, you, you say that he's likable, and, he, and he's, like, ordering these assassinations. And then you've got people like the foreign minister, Lavrov, who I have, uh, on more than one occasion, been in the same room with, like, when he was mm -hmm. at, at, at big State Department events overseas, or, you know, um, as, a, as a journalist. And um, he, he looks, quote, what I would say, normal, <laughs> if, such, if such a thing. He doesn't look like the kind of guy who would be ordering assassinations himself. But he is so loyal to Putin. No, that is uh, right. Lavrov is not a type of guy who is uh, organizing assassinations, obviously. But he must know point... about them. Yeah, everybody knows about them. At, uh, at one point in time, he was seen as a great reformer of uh, the Russian Foreign Service. But uh, then uh, Putin just corrupts everybody. He is giving money here and there. For uh, uh, Mr. Lavrov, for example, he gave certain commercial loans, which Lavrov would not be uh, uh, able to return. And then he's on the hook. And uh, that's the, the way how Putin, as a mobster, that's the way how he controls people. Well, a couple weeks ago— He tried to corrupt me as, as, as well. He, well. he offered me— he offered me a, What did he, he offer you? He offered me a promotion in, uh, in uh, my home region of uh, Novosibirsk. And his people were directly offering me money. A few weeks ago, the Wagner Group uh, had that sort of attempted coup. We had that sort of march towards uh, uh, Moscow. Um, is Putin worried about his own security, or is he locked up everybody around him so much that he's not worried? No. Uh, from one side, I think that Putin is uh, pretty much paranoid about his uh, security as all dictators. Uh, uh, he is thinking about the potential treasons that uh, may happen around him. He is always tossing his surrounding, his security. Uh, he is provoking conflicts. Uh, in, uh, within his inner circle. So he does all this. In terms of particular uh, Wagner and Evgeny Prigozhin, who is the leader of the Wagner group, I am certain that Putin knew about this uh, mutiny in advance. And Prigozhin, for him, is one of the most trusted men. And I think that he remains as such. You mean, Prigozhin, he's, he's still a favored person with Putin after leading an attempted coup? I uh, wouldn't say that he's a favorite person, but I think that he's still a trusted person. So he doesn't have a target on his back? He's not going to get— uh, I don't think so. You don't I think don't. Putin's going to kill him? I don't think so. I think that, actually, Prigozhin would get uh, several uh, important assignments in, in future if he didn't get one already. And uh, right now, that they're deploying forces in Belarus could be very much a threat for uh, Lithuania and uh, Poland, which may happen uh, in, in, the, in the near future. Well, um, I've been to Ukraine and Poland region four times since the war broke out in February of 2022. And when I've been in Poland, um, the Polish people are, have expressed to me, obviously it's not scientific, but a lot of them, including, um, you know, some who are high up in the government, that they actually, they actually fear that Putin has his designs on Poland, that, you know, that there's, it's not just Ukraine. Um, is, that, is that a legitimate fear? Yeah, I think so. Uh, 
obviously he would not make like a frontal uh, attack when the tank columns would invade and go uh, forward, so at least uh, uh, while Ukraine exists. Ukraine protects all of the uh, Western Bloc, uh, all of NATO countries from uh, Russia's direct invasion. But uh, a provocation like the one that can be done with uh, the Wagner troops, they have uh, 20,000 of uh, trained men. And uh, they have a course. Uh, there is a, a region of uh, Kaliningrad, which they separate from Russia, uh, and it's been separated by a stripe of land called uh, Suvalki Corridor, which connects Poland and uh, Lithuania. And to break into this corridor, to establish a land link, that's a possibility, and that he would say, oh, Wagner is not Russian army. Uh, they're just like some private individuals who volunteered to do something great for uh, Mother Russia. And then some members of NATO may uh, say, oh, they were not the state actors. That's why, why uh, Lithuanians uh, and uh, Poles are calling for the Article 5. And then where is the NATO? Oh, um, you have a, um, a cable news or a, a internet news service. Mm -hmm. Um, and, of course, inside Russia, RT, Russian, uh, for instance, the Russian television, it's all state-run. Mm -hmm. um, do you, are, are you getting, you're, you're broadcasting from inside Ukraine. Are you finding that your message is getting into Russia and that you're having any impact on the Russian people? Because as we see it on the outside, is that the Russian people, at least they're not up in arms about the war, you know, in a big way. Obviously, our signal is weak in this uh, in this regard. So our monthly audience is about eight million people, and there are 145 million Russians uh, out there. Um, uh, so we are seeking the ways how to uh, expand the reach. Uh, and we are talking with uh, the same Poland, for example, right now, so to get onto the uh, satellite, because Ukrainians, for many reasons, cannot do this. They do support us uh, otherwise, but uh, they cannot enrich our, our broadcast. Uh, but it's still, uh, it's, uh, it's pretty slow. And uh, uh, in general, I think that uh, the West is very reluctant uh, to uh, have a coherent strategy on what is supposed to happen. Uh, there is a lot of aid that goes uh, into Ukraine, and we are very thankful uh, that this aid exists. But without having a strategy how the war would end, you will never be able to win. And uh, that's uh, something that we are discussing here in, the, in this town all the time. But this is something which this administration is very shy of admitting. Uh, the sanctions work? I mean, are the sanctions having an impact on Russia? No, obviously they do work. Uh, uh, well, he's still, he's still fighting the war, though. I mean, they can't work that uh, much. I mean, no, they, uh, for the question is that uh, Russian economy has a huge uh, financial cushion. Uh, Putin was saving a lot of cash. And so he's not that much dependent on the inflows of money at the moment, and still Russia is selling a lot of uh, oil and gas that uh, go into uh, uh, China, that go into India, and uh, that helps him to sustain the economy and the military operations. What is most important are the personal sanctions. Uh, and personal sanctions, which have immediate impact on uh, particular nasty individuals, uh, which are helping Putin to run his uh, country. It's just that they would be uh, fully efficient only when there is a way in and a way out. If you are not providing a person the way how he can ch switch sides and start doing something for the uh, victory of uh, Ukraine and the Western coalition and defeat of Putin's regime, then he is getting stuck with Putin, and that uh, decreases efficiency uh, uh, of the sanctions. What do you think Putin thinks about President Biden? I think that he thinks that he is weak. Weak? No. I think that he, is, uh, he thinks that it's uh, a classical political person, uh, which uh, has all his career uh, in official ranks uh, of the government, and uh, that he is following a certain uh, rules of engagement that are used in the bureaucracy, uh, and that prevents him to go all the way. I think that uh, Putin is always uh, afraid of charismatic people, uh, of people who can make bold and unexpected decisions. Uh, 
And uh, that's why when President Trump was in office, Putin uh, was uh, way more respectful uh, towards uh, United States position because he thinks that they more or less appear. Uh, uh, Putin also uh, uh, don't like Zelensky, uh, and he is not respecting Zelensky, but he's afraid of Zelensky also for the same thing, because uh, Zelensky is a type of personality who can make bold moves, and Putin is very uneasy next to such people. I neglected to welcome you to the United States, but as a follow-up, welcome to the United States, but as a follow-up, why are you here? I am here because we have a Congress of People's Deputies after the invasion started, so now Russians start to self-organize, and we think it's not American cause to defeat Putin, it's us, Russian cause to, to uh, defeat Putin. And we established a shadow Russian parliament, which right now has 93 former members of uh, Russian parliaments of all, uh, of all levels. And uh, we seek establishment of official relationship with different parliaments of the world. We have now good relationship with uh, Eastern European uh, governments and legislative bodies. But uh, again, in the United States, the process is way slower. The people are way more cautious. So we are negotiating, explaining, convincing, and showing the way how we can end this war. Sir, thank you very much for joining me. Good luck. Thanks for having me.